Why do we find puzzles fun? That is, not a rhetorical question, I'm absolutely serious. All other kinds of games have some sort of immediately satisfying or exciting element to them. Action games get our blood pumping, narrative games have the twists and turns of the story to entertain us, and even the most dry and punishingly intricate strategy games have the fun of matching wits with an opponent. By comparison, the quiet and often solitary nature of puzzles is less immediately engaging to say the least. I don't know about you, but the high-octane ultraviolence of Doom will always be a fair bit more exciting than Picross. And yet, puzzles are one of the oldest and most enduringly popular kinds of games out there, dating back to the earliest known puzzle of them all, the Stomachion, which is all about fitting triangles into a rectangle and it's way harder than it looks. In spite of what seems like a proclivity towards restrictive and slow-paced design, puzzles span both the physical and digital world in a variety of forms. So I'll ask again, where does the fun of puzzle games come from? Is it something about how they're tailored challenges with specific answers? Kind of, but I don't think that's the whole picture. Is it the satisfaction of putting in a lot of mental effort and the pride of a job well done? Maybe, but that's hardly unique to puzzles. As silly as it sounds, this question had me well and truly stumped while writing this script. So in classic Architect of Games fashion, I procrastinated and screwed around on the internet until I stumbled upon this random Wikipedia article and suddenly everything made sense. Eureka! It's worth noting at this point that the article in question was about the word Eureka. See, Eureka in its original Ancient Greek means a discovery, and was supposedly shouted by the mathematician Archimedes when he sat down in the bath, giving him a revelation about using water to precisely measure the volume of an object, because the amount displaced is always equal to the volume of the object. He then used this revelation to solve a previously thought unsolvable problem of distinguishing precious objects made purely from gold from counterfeit ones made from less valuable metals without destroying them. In other words, Archimedes had discovered a new way of looking at the world and used this new understanding to solve a puzzle. See where I'm going with this? The joy of puzzle solving doesn't necessarily come from the answer itself, but from the change in perspective and the learning experience we go through in order to get there. Did I mention that Archimedes also built this thing? Yeah, he knew precisely how fun puzzles were, and how intrinsically related they are to humanity's scientific curiosity. By exploring and experimenting with the world around us, we can not just discover new things, but also new ways of analysing what we already know, and I think it's these sorts of perspective changes and opportunities of discovery that form the backbone of all good Eurekas, and thusly, all fun puzzles. Uncovering a new mechanical interaction in Braid, spotting the trick that lets you beat a conundrum in Professor Layton, or literally changing your perspective in Monument Valley. They all require you to discover a new way of looking at the world, and apply logic in a slightly different way than you're used to. Which brings me on to Portal, a puzzle series with a particularly intimate relationship with science. And not just because it's set in a lab and contains robots. The secret to this franchise's success is the fact that none of its puzzles require that much in the way of brainpower to actually solve. Instead, they're focused on letting players experiment and discover their way to victory. Take this puzzle from around the middle of Portal 2, involving the brilliant bouncy gel, as well as a misbehaving box. You start the puzzle with a classic setup. You need to activate this switch in order to lower a platform that will take you to the exit. But when you step off of it, the platform goes back up, meaning you need a weighted storage cube to hold it down for you. Oh, like that one right there. Unfortunately, you need to get it out of this glass box, and no matter how much you try, you can't portal to it or bounce over to it with the gel. But hang on, you can spray gel into the box, prompting this really fun interaction where the cube smashes its way out and starts bouncing around. Perspective change number one. Then, you think the puzzle is over as you put the cube on the switch, only to discover that it won't stay put, forcing you to work out that you can clean it off with water the exact same way that you can clean terrain. Perspective change number two. Finally, it turns out that the button only calls the lift down and you need to figure out a way to move the box so it goes back up. This prompts players to put into practice the lessons they've learned in the easy first half of the puzzle to recoat the box in repulsion gel from their new vantage point, firmly cementing in their brain the idea that bouncy gel is a great way to move objects without directly touching them, something that comes in handy much later when faced with an army of turrets. Perspective change, numero tres. Each step through the puzzle gives players something new to discover, rewarding them for their observation and creativity. 
Because Portal liberally dishes out these relatively free Eureka moments, the game is able to quickly and effectively teach players new mechanics, confident they'll have mastered the basics enough to solve ones that are a bit more challenging later on. Like how the original Portal spends an entire test chamber letting you figure out how to fling yourself with gravity, so that you'll be able to work out you can fire Portal's midair later in the game without prompting, making the discovery much more satisfying. However, leaning too hard on the raw spectacle of discovery can create issues. In a lot of ways, Eureka moments are kinda like junk food. Constantly learning new things and changing your perspective feels great in the moment, but if you do it too much, or don't pair them with some substantiative challenges that are more deeply satisfying, you'll start to get sick. Nowhere is this more evident than in the case of Superliminal, a game that's a pretty heavy homage to Portal, but instead focused on size-changing puzzles and optical illusions. Initially, the game feels awesome. Each and every puzzle is another twist on this core theme of analysing the world and the objects from different directions, with cool moments where you make huge bridges out of tiny signs, shrink yourself by going into a recursive house, or make… a bunch of apples, which is… more fun than it sounds. However, Superliminal rarely slows down enough to actually challenge you on these concepts, instead discarding mechanics and moving on to a whole set of new ones after just a single chapter. Because the player is bombarded with so many discoveries so fast, and is never tested on actually understanding or retaining that information, eventually the quick and dirty, almost meth-like high of discovering something new fails to get the same response, forcing the game to work ever harder throwing more stuff at you just to keep you entertained. Learning something new doesn't feel fun if you're never given the opportunity to actually understand it for yourself. Most people I've seen play Superliminal start to lose interest around the two-thirds mark, once they get bored of going, Oh, yeah, that's… clever, I guess, without ever getting to feel clever themselves. This is why I think the scientific metaphor is so apt when it comes to describing and analysing puzzle games. If finding out new things and exploring brave new frontiers of knowledge was easy, we'd never have evolved such a powerful chemical reward system for doing just that. Puzzle games are at their best when they pair discovery with some sort of resistance to actually implementing your fancy new ideas in order to prove you've actually understood it. Take Baba Is You, for example. It follows in the grand puzzling tradition of showcasing a new mechanic or a fun new spin on existing mechanics in almost every level, keeping each and every puzzle feeling fresh. The early level, Off Limits, is all about teaching you that breaking rules can be just as powerful as making them, and level 10 of The Forest of Fall is all about introducing the Not operator. However, Baba Is You doesn't stop there. Even if you've worked out what you think the twist of an individual level is, or already foreseen the advanced application of a given word, you've still got to prove it by actually getting all the nouns, operators and objects into the right places, soccer band style, giving the otherwise fairly gimmick heavy puzzles some actual meat and allowing them to retain some challenge even after you've already understood the perspective change needed to beat them. The level platformer, for example, still requires some pretty clever manoeuvring to get a gravity affected kiki over to the other side of this ravine. Working out you can use the word and as a platform is just the first step. The Talos Principle has a unique reimagining of this dynamic. Instead of the element of discovery and having our perspective changed coming purely from the puzzles themselves, the strong narrative element which goes through quite a lot of twists and turns also adds an additional driving force to the gameplay. This means that the individual puzzles don't have to rely quite as hard on flashy gimmicks because you've usually got some audio logs to listen to or existential questions to ponder while you do them. Of course, this necessity of offering the player some resistance to make their eventual solve satisfying brings up an interesting problem. Unlike in a lot of games where players can learn from their mistakes, memorise patterns and alter their strategy, oftentimes in a puzzle game, if you're stuck, the mental barrier can feel insurmountable and you'll never get to the eureka moment that makes your effort worth it. It's very hard to balance difficulty in such a way that it can be at that sweet spot of not obvious but still discoverable for all players. Portal and its ilk can get away with it by keeping players entertained with a combination of funny writing and a lot of fun physics and platforming mechanics, but for purer puzzle games, designed to be more challenging, they run the constant risk of players hitting a wall and completely giving up. That's why many games have moved away from a more linear design to an open-ended structure that allows players to simply bounce off of or avoid puzzles that are giving them trouble and come back later. In Fez, the brilliant cross-dimensional puzzle platformer, you need 32 cubes to complete the game, and they come in two main varieties, yellow cubes and blue anti-cubes. Yellow cubes can be found by exploring the world and doing easier puzzles, whereas anti-cubes are a little more advanced, requiring some more dedicated effort to locate, and as a result feel very satisfying for experts to crack. The trick, however, is that there are 32 of each kind, and both count towards your final total, 
What this means is that players can rise to a level of challenge that's appropriate to them, with less experienced players able to feel just as satisfied with working out how to scale this tower as experts do figuring out what the hell this big clock is for. The Witness does the same thing. You only need to activate 7 out of 11 lasers dotted around the map to reach the final sequence, allowing players to skip stuff they find hard like the horrible audio based puzzles in the jungle. However, it also goes a step further. The Witness cleverly gates off access to particular areas using specific mechanics, meaning the players who haven't fully understood some of the more advanced stuff like the Tetris puzzles are never allowed to get out of their depth. This allows the Witness to keep teaching players with more basic puzzles, slowly conditioning them not only to understand what they do when they see a tricky one, but also to see the world differently. During my first playthrough, I walked into the castle area and failed to see what I was supposed to do. There were some very nice hedge mazes, but that was about it. It wasn't until later that I returned with a brain trained to spot hidden puzzles and realised that the hedge mazes were actually puzzles all along. And that's just the start. The Witness's island is packed with environmental puzzles and hidden challenges that a new player will simply walk right past, allowing their growing relationship with the world to be one giant perspective warping eureka as they uncover a whole new layer of puzzles they had no idea existed. My mind basically blew itself apart when I realised that this lake was actually a map of the island, showing the locations of not just the lasers and the mysterious monoliths, but every puzzle in the game, if you know what to look for. On that note, it's also important to communicate to the player where those all important eureka moments are going to be coming from, and also where to look for puzzle solving inspiration. In games primarily about spatial awareness and platforming, trying to think your way around problems or calculate things with maths is only going to lead to frustration, so games need to establish their scope early and clearly communicate to players what they're all about. The Swapper, for example, is focused on, you guessed it, swapping and clone creation mechanics, even going so far as to heavily structure the story around them as well. With this dual reinforcement as a constant reminder of what the core of the game is about, the player is conditioned to think exclusively in terms of the game's central themes, and will instinctively know how to approach puzzles, namely by sacrificing hundreds of clones in the name of progress, rather than trying to platform their way around or search for hidden pathways. Antichamber is great at this as well, being a game all about challenging your expectations and lateral thinking. Its first few stages are full of misdirects, jokes at the player's expense, and non-Euclidean geometry, forcing the player to master the crazy rules or lack thereof that govern its world, or risk going in circles forever. By the time you reach what you thought was the exit, revealed to be yet another joke, the game will finally click, and you'll be equipped to question everything and never trust the obvious solution, saving yourself from butting your head against seemingly impossible puzzles forever. Communicating to the player what's not a part of the puzzle is just as important. One of the least fun things a puzzle game can do is unintentionally hide a crucial element or trick you into thinking that something is a part of the puzzle when it actually isn't. Avoiding this problem is the reason why Portal's visual design is so deliberately spartan. Everything that you can see in a level is always relevant to the solution, be it a cube, a launcher, or a big red button. Even in Portal 2, where you go through several messy, ruined levels, there's still a clear delineation between usable items and piles of trash, thereby preventing the frustrating experience of, in effect, trying to solve a puzzle that doesn't exist. Maquette is incredibly guilty of this. The game is all about size-changing puzzles centred around this recursive central diorama. You can drop a bridge on the model and it'll appear in the real world, but giant now. Similarly, if you put down a regular-sized key and then pick it up from the maquette, it'll be really tiny. You get the picture. This leads to some really interesting puzzles and some absolutely gorgeous set pieces. Unfortunately, this commitment to visual flair undermines a lot of the puzzle design. You see this huge fairground filled with interesting things? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that it is completely irrelevant to any and all puzzles. In fact, as impressive as it looks, none of it can even be interacted with. Maquette, however, doesn't tell you that, and I spent 10 minutes wandering around this place looking for something to climb, pick up, or activate, only to realise the entire puzzle came down to pulling a lever behind a wall. Another example is in the case of this house that I needed to get this green gemstone out of, while this red one was still inside. I played around for ages with the maquette, trying all sorts of size configurations and methods of getting it out of this landing, only to discover that the game's central gimmick was irrelevant and I just sort of needed to pass it through this grate that I'd mistaken for decoration. Because Maquette does such a poor job of defining what is and is not a part of its puzzles, its genuinely good reveals and eureka moments are blunted by the frustration of trying to solve a puzzle with the wrong tools. It's hard to think outside the box when you don't know where the edges of the box are, right? 
puzzles occupy a weird space between being heavily authored with specific, tailor-made design and being ultimately led by the player. A developer must point players to the solution, but with a light enough touch that it feels like they discovered it themselves. Too direct an influence results in unsatisfying solves that don't mean anything, while expecting too much out of the player just leads to them getting frustrated. While the real-life scientific puzzles we grapple with every day in all likelihood weren't designed by anyone, the key to solving them lies in the same place. Clinging dogmatically to outmoded ways of looking at the world will lead to stagnation, while directionless wandering won't get you anywhere. All good puzzles, and all good discoveries, require us to keep what we've learned in mind, yet apply new information and experiment with new possibilities to reach that all-important eureka moment. The story of Archimedes in his bath might be, historically speaking, basically bullshit, but it served as an important stepping stone for me to crack a completely unrelated puzzle. Just as the breadcrumbs laid down by designers give us the raw material we need to progress, but not until we put in the work of interpreting them, and then learning from them. Puzzles are a complicated and delicate aspect of game design because they're so deeply woven into the human psyche. We feel compelled to seek out and solve mysteries because doing so is the ultimate human survival skill, and our culture is evolved around creating and sharing puzzles as a way to hone and better our logical and lateral thinking skills. Puzzles have been a part of games for thousands of years, and judging by the amount we've got to deal with right now, that's not going to change anytime soon. So when you're done playing through Portal for the umpteenth time, could you do us all a favour and give climate change a crack because, let me tell you, I've been stuck on that thing for ages and I can't find a walkthrough anywhere. Seriously, I'm out of ideas. Oof, that was a bit of a bummer, wasn't it? Jesus. Anyway, welcome to the special After the Video segment, where you and me have a special one-on-one -on -one chat away from all the riffraff. Our talking points for today are a YouTuber that you should really check out, and a shout out to my lovely patrons. The YouTube channel you really owe it to yourself to take a look at is Writing on Games, which features some really fantastic think pieces on everything from cyberpunk to the underrated gem that is Asura's Wrath. His most recent video, all about Microsoft Flight Sim, starts as a story about a series of interesting glitches and slowly transforms into a really insightful look at games being more than a simple product. All the videos are great, give them a look, and there's also a link in the description. Now, as for that other thing, I always like to give a shout out to my top tier patrons, mostly because I told them I would, but also because they're lovely and they deserve it. If you'd like to join them, all you've got to do is sign up to my Patreon to help support the channel. It's very much appreciated, and as a reward you get a bunch of bonus things, as well as getting to count yourself in the company of these illustrious people, who are Alex DeLonch, Alex Vieira, Andrew Lebrano, Asaran, Ashley Shade, Ausakav, Big Chess, Brian Notariani, Constantina Punkt, Cosmics360, Daniel Medjez, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Evie, Gaskell, Greta Hannison, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Joey Bruno, Jordan Gear, George Aria Navarro, Joshua Binswanger, Kai Gillespie, Lee Berman, Lucas Slack, Mace Window 54, Max Filipov, NWDD, Nate Graff, Patrick Romberg, Pavel Yaroz, Philby the Bilby, Prospero, Petter Zasbo Daniel, Redadex, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Strateger in Ultima, The Forbidden Shrimp, Tyler Duncan, Zerkane, and Chow. That is it, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.